All right, I'm going to go ahead and we're going to go ahead and get started then. I'm going to say a prayer and then we will get going. Father in heaven, we just, um, we come to you and, and your name is hallowed. You're to be revered, to be glorified, to be honored. And uh, you're the king of the universe and, and you're, you know no boundaries, no limits. Um, nothing is too difficult for you. Um, your, your power is more than we could even begin to fathom. And yet, Father, your love is so deep. You care about what's going on here tonight among all of us in our lives at every single moment, um, so much so that uh, Jesus said our hairs are numbered. And so, Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for the cross where, where John is taking us and where he's leading us in this gospel. And, and Father, I just pray that you give us eyes to see, give us ears to hear, uh, that we, we start to discern and understand more and more of who Jesus is and that we fall in love with him more and he's the center of our life and, and that we surrender our lives and take up our cross and follow him. And so we're just thankful for your word and um, just help us tonight to understand more and more in Jesus' name, amen. So Awesome, you know, just going through it, it, it is, scripture is just amazing, is it not? I mean, when you read through it and when you take time to actually meditate upon it, think about it, I've been going through, I memorized the Sermon on the Mount um, I don't know, five, six, seven years ago. And then, you know, when you don't repeat it over and over again, you end up forgetting it. So I thought that I was just going to go back now and, and refresh and memorize it again. And I've, so I, now I've got chapter five memorized and still have the six and seven, but it comes back pretty quick when, when you've already done it before. If, you know, I could write it out for you, but you're putting me on the spot and I'd choke right now. But blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs. I could give you the Beatitudes real quick, but we won't take the time. But, um, but, um, it's just, you know, it's funny how when you, when you are in God's word, when you're meditating on it, when you're memorizing it, when you're just thinking of it, living in it, applying it, how often the things that you're studying comes up and how God just uses it over and over and over again. So I, I would say that, sure, we should grow in our knowledge uh, of it and, and our understanding of it, but even when we just start with little pieces, it's amazing how much God starts to do and, and use through that. So I know the Gospel of John, I've just kind of been amazed in, um, as we go through it. In, in chapter 11, we'll just start here with page one, but chapter 11 um, begins with the disciples warning Jesus. He, Jesus says, okay, let's head back to Jerusalem, let's head back to Judea, and the disciples say, you know, the, the, the religious leaders wanted to stone you, why are you wanting to head back there? And um, so we're starting to see where John is taking us. So this chapter 11 starts off with the disciples warning Jesus not to go back to Judea. And then it ends with the high priest declaring that, that one man must die for the people. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but prophetic words that he didn't even know he was uttering, what he meant by that. And, and so it's just we're, we're now starting to turn the corner a little bit and heading for home, um, leading to the cross. And, you know, as I was going through it, John wrote Revelation as well. And I think it's in Revelation chapter 5 where it talks about who's worthy to, to, to open the scroll, to unlock the scroll. And basically what, what, the, what John was asking as he's been taken kind of in this vision to heaven is, is saying who is worthy to fulfill God's plan? Who is the one that can act, you know, his judgment and his, his salvation plan? And, and he's crying because there's no one's worthy. And it says the Lion of Judah. And then when John turns around, he doesn't just see the lion, he sees a lamb. And I think that's where John has taken us, where Jesus is the lion of Judah. And he's strong and courageous and powerful. But, but he came as a king and as the master of the universe in a way that nobody would ever thought. That lion is the lamb. And we're going to see how now, you know, through all these Passover references, all these different things where, where Jesus is, is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, just like John the Baptist said. So pretty cool. So I want to read there John chapter 11, verses 3 to 7. It says, So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, The sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. And, and when you read that, that doesn't make much sense at first, does it? When he says he loved them, so he stayed two more days. That's kind of upside down here. You're thinking if you loved them, then head out there real quick or just say the word like you've done before and, and he would be healed. But it says because he loved them. 
He stayed two more days. I think he had something even more important for these people um, to know and to see, even than just the healing of Lazarus. And, and again, I think that these, that these miracles that we've seen, I think this is all building. It's kind of coming to a climax. I mean, you can almost feel the tension rising and the suspense rising as he gets ready to call Lazarus out from the grave. So um, again, doesn't make sense. But, but also it says that he waited for two days. And you know, I, I read reading one scholar as we were studying up on it, and he said, Jesus, more than likely took those two days um, in prayer. You know, sometimes I think we, we, you know, Jesus is fully human. Jesus is also fully God. But um, I, I think sometimes we almost picture Jesus as playing the God card more often than maybe what he did. And, and this scholar was talking about him probably taking two days immersed in prayer, praying for Lazarus, praying, that guy said, praying that the body wouldn't stink because they said he was in the grave four days, and when they rolled away the stone, it, it didn't smell, it didn't stink, but also probably praying for what he knew was to come place shortly, that this was pointing to the resurrection of Lazarus, was pointing to you know, his own resurrection, his own death, so um, kind of cool. But um, Romans 8, 28, again, in this situation, here's Lazarus sick, dying. You could picture his sisters thinking, there's no way anything good can come from this. As a matter of fact, you screwed up, Jesus. If you had, if you had been here, this wouldn't have happened. And yet we read in Romans 8, 28, we know that, God, that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. And I think he's saying that you're going to see something amazing here. This is for God's glory and God's glory and for, for your benefit. So John chapter 11, verse 9 and 10, it says, Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. And, and, um, and, I, and I think this is pointing towards, we see it in the life of Jesus. He continues to reference over and over again that he came to do God's work, that he was enlightened by God, that he was dependent upon God, that, that, you know, that he was here to do whatever the Father sent him to do. And I think as he says, as we walk in the light, there's a similarity there that we are to, to be totally reliant upon Jesus, to we're, to we're to be submissive to him, we are to do what he calls us. So we've seen this over and over again in the gospel, and I think it's a pattern that, that we want to follow, that we're to be dependent upon Jesus as he was on the Father. And when we do that, when we follow him, when we're in prayer, we're in communion, when we're in fellowship with him, then I think our life is going to produce more and more the fruit that he offers as we're in concert with what the Holy Spirit's guiding us and directing us to do. So move over to page two. Um, in verses 11 through 14, which is where, where Jesus basically says that Lazarus has fallen asleep and he's going to go there. And, and, and we've seen kind of these conversations that Jesus has had a few times so far in John where he's speaking at one level and the people are hearing on a completely different level because they even respond there, well, if he's asleep, he'll wake up, which is probably what I would have thought as well. I mean, you know, and then Jesus plainly tells them, you know, Lazarus is going to die. But if we look back, remember when Jesus spoke with Nicodemus? He said, you've got to be born again. And Nicodemus says, how can you enter a womb a second time? When he goes to the woman at the well and he says, if you had asked me for water, you know, you would have never thirsted again. And she says, well, give me this water. Who wouldn't want that? And, and, um, and the bread of life dialogue where the people had to be thinking, is, is this man a cannibal? I mean, what's going on? And to where Jesus is speaking of spiritual things. And, and these people aren't quite grasping. And then Jesus has to go maybe a little deeper and talk more plainly um, for people. So maybe we can pray that we have spiritual eyes to kind of see and to hear what we say. In verse 16, in, in this blunt, honest way, kind of, Thomas is kind of a Debbie Downer a little bit. He says, well, I guess we'll go back to Judea and die with you as well. I mean, that's, that's where we're heading. And again, while it seems a little pessimistic, again, I think that that's kind of a prophetic word from him. He was actually right. While the disciples weren't going to die at that point, that, that kind of sealed their fate. Jesus was going back to Jerusalem. He was going to die. He was going to be the Lamb of God. And those who followed him, and those who still follow him, are to take up their cross. And eventually it led to the, the martyrdom of, of all those people as well. So um, verses 23 to 37. Again, Jesus has another cryptic conversation, and, and by this point in Jewish history, so he's speaking with, with uh, Martha, and Martha, you know, Jesus says, your brother's going to rise again, and Martha says, I know he will at the resurrection. So by this time, the Jews had come to believe in a resurrection. Most of the Jews believed in it, but even here at this point, Jesus says, no, just, just wait a minute. There's going to be that day coming, but even right now, your brother's going to be raised, you know, raised to life. So um, John chapter 11, verses 25 to 27 
Jesus said to her, and, and I think this would be one of these main verses that we get. We're going to see John 14 next week where he says, I'm the, the, the way, the truth, and the life. But here, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God who has come into the world. So again, I wrote there, the drama seems to be building. Um, basically, Jesus saying, you haven't seen anything yet. And, and think of that. I mean, we, we've seen where he spoke to Nathaniel and, and saw Nathaniel while he was under the fig tree. We've seen him turn water into wine now. We've seen him clearing out the temple. We've seen him um, speak to the woman at the well and tell her about her past. We've, we've seen, seen him healing the government official son, healing the lame man at the pool of Bethesda. He's fed 5,000 men, not including women and children. He's walked on water. He's healed a blind man. He's saying, I am the one. And you haven't begun to see all the things that I'm going to do or that I can do. And, and John even declares that later on. He said, if I've, I've just chosen certain things to, to speak about Jesus. If I had written down everything that he's done, he says, I suppose the whole world couldn't contain those books. But he says, I, you know, Jesus is saying, I, I am God. I am and he's going to even do greater things. And raising Lazarus from the dead is, is kind of at the top of that list that's coming. I mean, I, again, I think this, this wave is building. And then eventually we're going to see the greatest thing is when Jesus willingly gave up his life only to take it back again. So John eleven thirty two to 35, it says, When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. And Jesus wept. Does anybody, just raise your hands, does anybody find that passage a little strange? I mean, Jesus knows he's going to be bringing Lazarus back to life. If I was the one, if I... If, if I had that power and someone close to me's family was with me and, and they're, you know, basically saying, Herc, if you'd been here, he wouldn't have died. And, and I knew what I was doing. I don't think I would be weeping. I think I would be so excited, almost jumping up and down saying, just wait, you can't, you, you won't even believe what you're going to see. I wouldn't be sad because I would know that in just a moment, like if I went to a funeral and a person was in a coffin and I knew that I was going to be bringing them back to life, I personally wouldn't be sad. I'd be fired up and excited and thinking, you're crying now, but just stop. You don't have to. So what do you think's going on here? I mean, you know, did, did, it says that he was troubled, that he was weeping, and, and um, you know, I've heard a few different things on that. One, I, I think obviously the people around them were crying, and I think that impacted Jesus. Would, would we probably all agree with that? He was a compassionate individual. He was... Um, I mean, yeah, he's mourning with those who mourn. But again, in my own mind, which I, I know I'm wrong here, but in my own mind, I'm thinking, I, I wouldn't be crying with these people. I'd be saying, just, just wait, you know. But I, but I think that shows him, you know. Also, we're kind of told here real soon that Jesus knows what's coming for him. And, and I think that's starting to hit him. Again, we, we have this tension of Jesus being fully God, but being fully human at the same time. So he knows his time is near. I think this, this, these passages all start to make sense a little bit earlier in the Gospels when he would kind of be on the lowdown, say, don't go telling anybody, you know, and, and great crowds are following, and, and because it wasn't the time. And now I think Jesus is starting to know that the time is here. So while I'm sure he was moved by the people around him, I'm also sure that he was moved by you know, by also what was to come for him and probably those prayers that he'd been praying because the time is getting very close. He's heading back to Jerusalem and he knows that he's heading back um, to his own death and to that great suffering and the separation from the Father. There was that, but I also heard years ago a, another scholar talk about it and, and I'm not a, a Greek scholar or anything like that, so can't confirm, but talked about when Jesus was troubled. There was also an anger there, like an anger of the condition of this world and anger that death has come onto the scene, and he knows that he's the one that's going to wipe that out, and, and there's anger with a sin-filled world, anger at the evil one. So all of these emotions are bubbling up, and, and Jesus is getting ready to do something about it. 
You know, he's getting ready to, to bring Lazarus back from the dead. But again, I think even more than that, he knows that soon he's going to defeat death. He's going to defeat sin um, in a way that only the lion lamb could do. And so I, I think there's just a lot maybe going on. But, but I, I believe that Jesus is compassionate, that he feels what we feel. He's a man of sorrows, that, that when we hurt, he hurts. We have an amazing God. When you just, again, when you read through this and, and to put a real face on these people and on these times. So um, Jesus wept. You can memorize that verse. It's the shortest one in the Bible, but you, you should all be able to have that one memorized. So um, Matthew 10, verse 30 to 31 says, even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. And, and I think that's part of, he cares for us. Hebrews 4.15 says, we don't have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has yet been tempted in every, who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he didn't sin. Again, we, we don't have a distant God. We have a God that has gone through every situation, tough situation, temptation that we have. He identifies with that. He can, he can feel that. And yet he was the perfect one that went through it. Isaiah 53, 3 through 5 says, He was despised and rejected by mankind. Again, passage written 700 years before the time of Christ a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we were healed. John 11 Verses 37 to 44, moving on. Again, I think I just want to share those passages because that's the Jesus that we have. That's the one that we serve. He, he, he came to connect with us. He came to, to feel what we feel, to go through what we've gone through, and he went through it worse than any of us could ever imagine, and that's just a, a, an amazing Savior. So John 11, 37 to 44. Some of them said, could he who opened the eyes of the blind man not have... Could, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Again, they, they mock him. He's done all these miracles. He's coming, and they're thinking, yeah, I'll talk. I mean, he's done these other things, but he came and came and saved one of his best friends. Jesus, once more deeply moved. So again, we see this, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad, bad odor, for he has been in there four days. And Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? Again, Jesus and God, they're in the resurrection business. Part of what John is trying to say to us is the kingdom has come. Jesus is on hand, and he's making all things new. So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. Again, I know we've said it over and over, but John's writing so that we believe that he is the word who became flesh, that he is the son of God here, that, that he was sent by God. It says, when he said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice. Can you imagine just this, this building up? People around there probably thinking he's nuts. And all of a sudden he yells, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out. His hands and feet were wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. I, I laughed when I read that. Isn't that kind of funny? <laughs> like you can almost picture, come out and, you know, and these, you know, and just almost like, I wonder if it, I wonder, it'll be, we'll have to ask Lazarus when we see him in, in heaven one day, where, what, what went on during those four days when you were dead? Like, were, were you dead? I mean, Jesus said you were sleeping. I know you were dead because you've been brought back to life. But, like, do you have a memory? Did you go to heaven? Were you just in a, what, what was that? But I thought it was kind of funny that almost like a zombie comes walking out. And Jesus says, take the clothes off of him and, and go your own way. And could you imagine the people that had said up there earlier in verse 15, those ones that said, oh, who is this guy? I mean, he saved other people. He can't even, make, you know, help the blind man. Can't, can't do this. The shame that maybe they felt. Or maybe what we've seen throughout John is that we really sometimes have hard hearts and people even won't believe if somebody comes back from the dead. And those are the words of Jesus. So again, I think we should pray for ourselves and for the people that we love and know and people that are far away from God that somehow God softens their hearts. John eleven forty eight to 53 says this, if we let him go on like this, these are the religious leaders talking now, everyone will believe in him. 
And then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. Then one of them named Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. You do not realize that it is better that one man die for the people than the whole nation perish. He did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. And not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God to bring them together and to make them one. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. And just wrote down a few things, you know, that... that um, it's real easy, I think. Um, this is something new. Jesus is coming onto the scene. He's got the fulfillment of the Old Testament. He's saying, I'm making all things new. And yet these religious leaders were afraid that their way of life was going to be gone. They valued comfort. They valued safety, their own, their own prosperity, their own money. They couldn't even open their eyes enough to this amazing message of Jesus. And, and so they're, they're afraid, I, I think, for a few reasons. They're afraid that the Rome is going to come. And here's Jesus talking of a new kingdom. Again, they didn't understand the kind of kingdom that he was speaking about, but he's talking about a new kingdom, and they knew that, that Rome didn't want to hear anything about a new kingdom. Rome was the kingdom. Rome was the one in charge. And so these religious leaders were afraid that if, if Jesus continued healing people, people were going to follow him, and they were afraid basically of this. I, I think many of them were afraid of this revolution that would take place, and, and they were afraid that Rome would be upset and, and, and come down and take away their religion, take away their prosperity, take away their freedom, uh, the limited freedom that they had. And, and, um, and we know that just a few years later in 70 AD, that actually happened, where Jerusalem was, was raised when the temple was torn down. Um, but it's just kind of a sad statement, you know, to think that they cared more about that than, than what was actually taking place in front of them. People being raised from the dead, blind people seeing, water being turned into wine, crazy. So without knowing it, there we're on page um, four, but without knowing it, Thomas had spoke words that were prophetic when he said, let's go to Jerusalem and die. And then Caiaphas here, the high priest, God somehow had him say these words that he didn't even know what they meant. Indeed, Jesus was going to die for the Jewish nation and also for the entire world to bring the children of God under his lordship and under his command. So while true events... Many of the things that John wrote about here were symbolic of what was happening with and through Jesus. So we read in this reading tonight where Mary anointed Jesus with perfume. Again, kind of a prophetic way showing where we're moving here in the story that she's getting his body ready for burial, even though she didn't know it, that Jesus was going to be dying. And then I just wrote on there, Judas was just a jerk, wasn't he? I mean, sometimes I think when we read the Gospels, we can almost sympathize with him when he ended up killing himself and kind of threw the pieces of silver. But, you know, he's a thief, traitor, betrayed this one that he had been with for these few years. I mean, you know, again, maybe we would do some similar things, but, man, he was a, he was a scoundrel. And I just wrote that for whatever. So the religious leaders, they're getting worse and worse. You know, the, again, Jesus has been in trouble this whole time, but it's getting heightened. Now they're out to get him. And not only just Jesus, it says that they're wanting to kill Lazarus as well. <laughs> Lazarus is, they're wanting to kill Lazarus, and all he did was die and get, get brought back to life. Kind of nuts. It's nuts. So, the religious, so Jesus rides into Jerusalem. It's on Palm Sunday. And, you know, I've read from a few things. If you go back in, into Exodus and read about the Passover, um, on 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 four days before, and I don't, I don't have the exact math, but basically on the Sunday before Passover, it was lamb selection day. In other words, families would go out, and I think it was on the 10th of that month, and they would go out and they would pick the lambs that they were going to be sacrificed. And they'd have to pick lambs that were unblemished, that were without imperfections. And they would, they would have this lamb and kind of be preparing for these next four or five days before they would slaughter that lamb on Passover. So it's pretty wild that Jesus comes riding into Jerusalem on, on Lamb Selection Sunday. Yeah. Oh, there, there, there you go. <laughs> so, but yeah, so um, that's the, that little Christian stupid humor. Uh -huh. so, so, but pretty wild where Jesus is riding in basically saying, hey, I, I'm the, the Lamb. Pick me, choose me. And we know that on that day as he's riding in, people are waving palm branches. They're yelling Hosanna, which means save us. And, and, and this king riding on a colt that was prophesied way back in Zechariah chapter 9. 
Um, and, and they're, I think, you know, probably into the lion part of this. Again, I think they're saying all this because Jesus now has even raised people from the dead. Surely he's the one that's going to overthrow Rome. Surely the one he is going to, he is the Messiah, the long-awaited king, and now we are going to be restored to our glory days like King David. We're going to go in and kick butt now. And again, they missed it. You know, as a matter of fact, we, we read in other Gospels where Jesus wept over Jerusalem and said, you know, you just don't get it. You've missed my whole message. You've missed my whole point. Palm branches, while we, we wave them on, on Palm Sunday and might think of a thing of peace, this would have actually almost been a sign of insurrection on some of the Jewish coins from the time when they were liberated, going all the way back to, to Hanukkah celebration that we kind of talked about last week. They would have put these palm branches on coins signifying their freedom. So as they're waving these palm branches and yelling Hosanna, they're not doing it in the way that we think of Jesus as king. They're doing it as this kind of military leader. This is the one that's going to, to overthrow the government. This is the one that's going to restore us and, and bring us back to those days. So... Um, He's the one, you know, the, the, so when they did this, it's obviously Passover, and we know there's great celebration and great remembrance, but they might have also had some, some thoughts from when Judas Maccabeus had, had overthrown the, the people that had desecrated the temple that we talked about last week. So Luke 19, verses 41 to 44. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. In other words, he said there's going to be great judgment on the nation of Israel in just a few years. And God's going to use the Romans to do it, and, and that ended up happening. And Jesus wept over it because he said it didn't have to go this way. You could have seen, you could have looked at the, the law and the prophets and realized that I was the one to fulfill them, that I was the, the lamb who takes away the sin of the world. John chapter 12, verses 20 to 21 on page five here, it says, now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. And again, I think now is the time. Now we're even seeing Gentiles come and want to see Jesus. And that was always part of the plan. That was always part of the mystery of the gospel was to, to now Gentiles are grafted in, grafted into the vine, that, you know, into the nation of Israel. And now people who, who follow Jesus Christ, who by faith believe in him, are true Israelites who are, who are actually the seed of Abraham. And I think this is starting to come where now this is happening. It's been the plan all along. It's going to be taking place as Jesus dies here soon. John 12, it says, Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it. And while, in, and while anyone who hates their life in this world would keep it for eternal life. And I think the principle that Jesus is saying here, and we know from him, but death brings about life. God did, did this with the cross, and, and he does it with each of us as well. When we fight to save our life, Jesus says we're actually going to lose it. But when we lose our life for him, when we sacrifice, when, when in the, the waters of baptism symbolizes that we go into the water and we are dead in our sins and trespasses, and now we're brought to newness of life and raised in, in a new creation. And, and again, death brings life. When we die to self, we're alive in Christ. And, and, and to follow Jesus I think is the way of the cross. So um, Jesus, John states that many people don't believe in Jesus because they're blinded with hard hearts. And again, there's a lot of Passover imagery in this. This would remind us of Pharaoh and Exodus and also the Israelites and the history of, of the nation over and over again. Moving on to John 42 and 43, chapter 12. It says, yet at the same time, many among even the leaders believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear they would be put out of the synagogue for they loved human praise more than the praise from God. And I just put, that's a real sad statement. We saw it with the man who was born blind, his mom and dad, same thing. Go, you know, talk to him. He's of age because they're afraid. And, um, and you know, I, I think that's sad. Hopefully we're not like that. Hopefully we're bold and, and, and with, our state, with, our, with our faith in Christ no matter what comes. Jesus is the ultimate judge. Even though he came to save and not condemn, there's a dividing line. And that dividing line is believing in Jesus. Those who believe have eternal life. It's pretty simple. Again, that's why John wrote this, so that we would have eternal life and have life in the name of Christ and live in that. And then 
the dividing line is you believe, you're saved, you don't believe, you're condemned. And I know we read John 3, 16 and 17 a lot, and it's appropriate. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. So Jesus didn't come to condemn. We're already condemned. He came to save. And we're condemned because of the sin in us. There's a sin problem, and we have to accept the work of Christ to be cleansed from the sin that, 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 we, that we are slaves to. And then God sets us free, makes us new, and the blood of Christ saves us from that. And, and, um, and, but there's a choice that we have to make. We have to come to Christ and have faith and not have blind eyes, not have hard hearts, but to surrender our lives to him. John 12, 49 and 50, it says, For I did not speak on my own, this is Jesus speaking, but the Father who sent me commanded me to say all that I have spoken. I know that this command leads to eternal life, so whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. Again, we're starting to see this, and we've seen it the whole time. Jesus is from the Father. He and the Father are one. When Jesus speaks, the Father is speaking, and Jesus has trust and faith in the Father and knows the Father's heart and knows that when he is mimicking, when he is saying what the Father sent him to say, that it leads to eternal life. And, and so the words that Jesus speaks, the life that he lived, um, brings, us, brings us to God, brings us to, to eternal life. And we know that eternal life, I think we talked about it last week, is knowing the Father and the one that he sent. That's eternal life. And that's, again, why John wrote this. So um, I'm not sure what time it is. Almost perfect. A couple minutes late, but we'll go ahead and go to a small group, but I'll, I'm going to pray one more time. Um, God, just, again, thank you for this record. Thank you for the, the things and the lessons that we can learn from tonight. Again, we go through it quick. My prayer is that we read and that we, we meditate and we let the word, your word saturate us. And that, um, Father, we thank you for the power that you have, the, the example that was set. And, and again, I, I say it almost every time I'm up here, but as we see on the back wall, it's all about Jesus. We thank you that you sent him. We thank you that you love us so much that our hairs are even numbered um, and God, and, and just help us to rest in that. Help us to have life in your name. We, we saw last week that you came so that, not just so that we could have life in heaven, but so that we could have joy and peace and, and abundant life right now. Father, we can live in your kingdom. We know it's not what it will be, and we look forward to the day that Jesus returns. But in the meantime, you have given us all we need, your presence, and we thank you for that in Christ's name. Amen. All right.